we shared the link on our Instagram. So hopefully people join in spontaneously mm -hmm. if they have time. Hi to everybody. Morning, everyone, or afternoon, maybe for some of you. I think that is a very super secret link. I can't believe you did that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll wait a couple more minutes. Plains Art Museums. 17th edition of Plains Art Museum's Art and Business Breakfast and, and hopefully the last virtual session, though I must say that the virtual sessions have allowed us to uh, interact with a, with a community that's uh, across the nation. It's been a, a joy. Um, we've had one sponsor for the five years of this program. That's been Heartland Trust Company. It's led by its president and our board chair, Brian Halverson. So I want to Thank Brian and Heartland Trust for their amazing support of Art and Business Breakfast. Today, our topic is art is a basic need, uh, though we'll see where the conversation takes us. One phenomenon that I noticed early on in the pandemic was the amplified and considerably amplified attention to engagement in and participation with a broad spectrum of creative and cultural expressions, not just in the United States, but worldwide, daily and hourly. Guitar playing from the rooftops in Rome, sidewalk chalk arts in a cul-de-sac in London, artists shrinking their studios into garages and still creating, duets of, and trios of singers of musical instruments playing in airport lobbies. Symphony musicians in the back of pickup trucks playing throughout urban neighborhoods. The serenading of essential workers from apartment buildings. The seemingly endless personalized mask making. Then the exhibitions of masks. Even today in the Ukraine, ballet and opera and violins are performing in apartment basements, also known as bomb shelters. And on and on and on. And how about the art of walking? I don't think I've seen as many people walking in my neighborhood uh, ever. So what percolated to the top of my thought was, and still is, why this global need for creative communication of self and of others? Are the arts like Maslow's hierarchical five a basic need? Is art that which makes societies human? Number six. Today, we have a panel of five remarkable arts-engaged people to discuss art as a basic need. So at this point, uh, I want to turn over to my friend and our moderator, Nicole Nafoni Amhara, for introductions and the beginning of the conversation. Nicole, it's all yours. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I get the privilege really to um, guide this conversation a little bit, although I've got a chance to touch base with um, most of the panelists uh, a couple of days ago. And I think we're in for a really engaging and rich um, and powerful conversation. Um, with that, I will just quickly introduce myself and get myself out of the way and then open it up to the panelists um, to say a little bit about themselves in way of introduction and then we'll kind of hop into the conversation. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Nicole Fanoy Amhara. I, I'm, in, I'm based in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm a New Yorker by heart, always and forever, um, but I'm here in Rochester, Minnesota. And um, I work as the program director for diversity programs at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. That's my day job, um, but I'm also a writer and an artist and I do um, my own creative, I have my own creative writing practice in fiction um, and then do a number of different um, arts writing and working alongside artists um, to sort of amplify their work and their voices through language and through writing in different formats. Um, so that's, uh, that's a little bit about me and I would love to um, pass it off to uh, Rob and Eric to introduce themselves first. Oh, hi, I'm Rob, I'm Eric. 
And um, we are contemporary art collectors that live in Minot, North Dakota. Um, I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, so we're here in Minot for my job here at the local hospital. And I'm a political theory professor at VCU, but um, also just started working on our first curatorial adventure for a gallery in Chicago that coincided with Expo Chicago. So we're kind of branching out a little bit. Yeah, and so we started collecting contemporary art about five or six years ago, um, and we started sharing our collection through Instagram, through the handle The Icy Gaze. Um, and because of that, we connected to kind of this um, international art community, um, like-minded gallerists, curators, museums, um, that were celebrating these same artists that we had fallen in love with, you know, female identifying artists, queer artists, artists from un underrepresented communities. And I think it's just been such a wonderful journey to connect with um, all these amazing people and have these conversations. So we're thrilled to be here and, and talk about this. Thank you so much, Robin. Eric, Betsy? Hi, I'm Betsy Bradley. I'm the director of the Mississippi Museum of Art in Jackson, Mississippi. I may be the most far-flung person among this group. Um, I'm really happy to be with you all. We are um, a, a general all-purpose museum in our state's capital in downtown Jackson. And we focus a lot on uh, mounting exhibitions and programs that investigate questions about what it means uh, to be in a state with the kind of history that Mississippi has, um, how we can um, come together with artists to envision um, a different and better future, and all the while connecting um, what we call the Mississippi story um, to be a central part of the conversation about America's history and story as well. Um, so just this past weekend, we opened a major exhibition that had funding from, from several New York foundations and uh, visitors from all over the country. So while we're kind of hyper-local in one way, we also um, imagine ourselves to be relevant to the national conversation. Thank you so much, Betsy. David? I'm David Hamilton. I'm the director of the Fargo-Moorhead Opera. I'm also a professor at Concordia College where I teach voice and Italian. Um, I am an opera singer and uh, I've been in Fargo for about 28 years, but prior to that I lived in New York, um, starting from my uh, graduate school days at the Juilliard School and then during the time I was singing at the Metropolitan Opera. And um, um, it's, it's, been a, it's been quite a journey. And the nice thing is that having been on the national scene as a performer, um, I've been able to maintain a lot of those connections and am able to bring uh, some of the national art to Fargo uh, by way of bringing uh, nationally recognized artists. Opera is not often thought of as, an, as a cutting edge art, uh, but uh, in, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of opera being written right now, especially in America. And opera really is about telling stories. Uh, and so today's operas are telling the stories of today. And we have, uh, we have, an, have done a number of uh, 21st century operas here at Fargo Moorhead Opera uh, so that we can tell today's stories in addition to the classic works that everybody knows and loves. Thank you, David. Scott? I'm Scott Stone. I am the uh, CEO and president of the Philbrook Museum of Art in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm also a Minnesota native. So I grew up in Minnesota and uh, I have my degree actually in uh, my master's in painting and drawing from University of Minnesota. And I have a lot of connections to this group because I also started my museum career in Rochester, Minnesota, the Rochester Art Center. So that's where I kind of uh, got into this whole museum field. So I spent five years in Rochester and then I was at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis as the director of mnartists.org for six years. And then at the Indianapolis Museum of Art where I started a curatorial department there that was the curator of audience experience and performance. Um, I was in Indianapolis for a couple of years and then was recruited to come to Tulsa to lead, lead the Philbrook. What makes me a little bit uh, unique um, as a museum director is I'm also a practicing artist and a musician and curator and do a lot of, I, I come from that maker side of things, 
uh, and bring, I think, a little bit unique perspective to my role here at Philbrook. Um, if you have not been to Philbrook, we are a uh, an historic home that is on 25 acres of, of formal and informal gardens here that has a kind of diverse collection that leans towards contemporary, but we really have a wide array of works um, in our collection and we're focusing on really making a very eclectic and welcoming experience here at the museum. Um, my shorthand has been that I've been here about five and a half years now. When I came in, you couldn't walk on the grass in the gardens and now we're giving kids shovels to go dig it up out in places. So that's kind of what we've been able to do here at the museum, <laughs> which I'm sure will come up as we have our conversation. But um, I'm honored to be with this group and thank you for inviting us. Wonderful, thank you so much, Scott. My apologies, that was my dog. The beauties of uh, remote work here. Um, well, to get us started, I mean, Sandy um, opened this up really beautifully with sort of that image around, um, you know, the observation around the arts and, and pandemic life. Um, and there goes my dog again, my apologies. Um, and you all, even in your introductions already have touched on this in different ways. Um, just the, the importance of the arts um, in, in our, our current and, and lives. And throughout the pandemic, this idea of essential work, of course, or frontline workers really took hold. And I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the political and social, um, the economic and cultural upheaval of the last few years. And to the panelists, how would we consider artists part of that essential work, sort of workers um, in a critical frontline in their own right? And how might that help us really rethink and um, how we support the funding of the arts as well as artists more sustainably. Well, I can jump in a little bit with um, how I think that art is one of the things that defines us as humans. Um, there's no culture that, that doesn't have art. Everyone sings until society knocks that ability out of them. Um, and so I, I think it was natural during this time of great stress um, during the pandemic that we saw this um, great outpouring of art uh, in all its forms from visual to performing art um, to help people mentally get through this time. I mean, my gosh, can you imagine having gone through the last two years with no art? Um, I think it would have just been truly dreadful for everyone. And um, so I think that it really is basic to what makes us human. Yeah, and I would just follow up that, um, you know, typically in the way our society functions, you have a very set role in your day-to-day -day activities, you know, because we need to make money in order to, you know, pay for whatever. Um, and I think we saw that, everyone suddenly had all this free time where they were, you know, trapped at home, but, you know, what were they going to do? And so I think, you know, we see a lot of people went on YouTube and learned how to paint or learned how to play an instrument, but it was also kind of um, the opposite of the type of lifestyle that we were used to living, where it was just like the day-to-day -day grind. And I think art actually, I hope, is more appreciated now because more people see the potential in it and how it gives us an outlet to kind of realize our own individual selves rather than just, you know, getting up and going to work and coming home and dealing with, you know, other obligations. So we indirectly, I guess, made more time for art because of the pandemic. Yeah, and I would echo that it really also creates a sense of community, you know, that you, uh, that you feel that there are other people that are that feel the way that you do or think the way you do or live the way you do. And you can also get insight into people that aren't like you and don't and don't live like you and, and don't have the same perspective on the world. And I think it can really allow a dialogue in that way that can be really special and really meaningful. Um, you know, uh, us visiting uh, artist studio and having these conversations about connecting across inter even international barriers through the language of art. And I feel like that happened on a national stage during the pandemic because of um, our ability to connect through the internet. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, I have a, a couple of uh, responses. First is we were closed here for four months um, from March through uh, July 10th. 
something like that, um, of 2020. And we reopened with a traveling exhibition of French artwork, Monet, Van Gogh, Degas. Um, and it was really pretty remarkable, the turnout for that exhibition and, and the people in the galleries with tears rolling down their faces. They were just so immensely grateful to be in a social space where they felt safe, but also to be surrounded by beauty. So, I, you know, that taught me a lot. And I also remember um, from my teaching days, um, an essay I taught, I think it was an essay, uh, by Florence Nightingale, maybe the world's most famous health professional, um, where she said something to the effect of, you can tell what our society values, um, and nothing against medical professionals, Rob, but by how much, they, how much we pay doctors to take care of our bodies and how little we pay teachers to take care of our souls. And I think that um, what one of the things that has inspired me throughout the pandemic is the way that artist productivity has soared, even when they were not getting paid, um, even when exhibitions were on hold and fellowships were on hold, um, they just kept producing more and more art. And we're now in a place where we're a beneficiary of it um, because we've got on view um, contemporary work by 12 African-American artists who made new work for us during the exhibition, I mean, during the pandemic. So, you know, even without kind of any motivation, um, financial motivation, they, they were more productive than ever. And I think in more meaningful ways, than ever, and some of them actually kind of admitted that they miss having to be alone so much. Um, but again, I think it's just the fact that people clamor for it, artists need to make it, um, even under the, the worst circumstances possible, um, we're reminded that it's essential. I'll jump into and maybe follow that, uh, Betsy, that I think, uh... I think there was different phases of the pandemic too. So I think there was different moments within this. And it's also very regional depending on where you, where you were. And I think we'll probably get into some of that, but it's a different experience. We in Tulsa were shut down for about three months um, overall. And there was that initial period where I think you saw a lot of artists shifting to this online platform, learning things like Zoom, having, we realized we could have conversations like this around the country and things that I think that have stuck. But I think it was this unique moment of focus because we were all just basically at home and looking online at things. So we were focused and be able to see some of these activities that were happening, some of the artists that were out there making things. There was just this unique moment where we kind of were focused on a much smaller kind of bandwidth. And artists are gonna make art, they just are. And I think it's always happening. It's just a matter of what, when we're paying attention to it and when we're actually kind of seeing it in different places. But I do think there was that kind of unique, particularly those first couple of months, where I think not only artists were kind of looking for creative outlets, but I think all sorts of people that would not necessarily just not define themselves as artists were making creative activities and learning something new. And as somebody who tried to buy a new guitar during that period of time, it took eight months to get one because they're all gone. <laughs> So I think that was a really good thing as people were looking for these uh, different kind of things to either teach themselves or to continue a something that maybe is a hobby, but maybe a profession with finding these creative outlets. I also think it's not e equal. So I think there's a lot of people during that period of time that didn't have a lot of extra free time. It was actually like working three times as much. And so I think there is certain kind of, there is an inequality in some of that so that sometimes we don't completely address. And as somebody running an institution, I can tell you it was not a break <laughs> during that period of time. And I know there's other people on here that have similar experiences, but um, I think as things have kind of evolved, there's some other stuff that kind of kicks in though too, is like how do, how do artists that do need to make their living from making their art adapt? And like, how do they find different spaces to be able to showcase their work and have that work supported? And coming back to the original question, you know, I do think we need to be talking about what we value in society 
and whether it is one of those essential needs that we have that sometimes maybe we do take it for granted, but when things are kind of stripped down and we really are looking at the essentials of safety and what home is in our family, is art one of those things? And I think the last couple of years proved that it is one of those things that we lean on. We lean on it for healing and we lean on it for comfort and we lean on it for connection. And we're, we'll find a way, whether it's through Zoom or whether it's through something out in the physical world. So I think it's, I think we're still processing it and it's gonna be interesting what kind of comes out of this going forward. Thank you all for that. And Scott, certainly I love that sort of art. Um, Art, artists will, you know, artists will always be making art. Art will, will always make its way through. Um, and you brought it up and I was gonna bring it up later, but um, the issue of equity, right? Um, you know, what, you know, I think we can very easily in our, our many roles and in our privilege really sort of sit there and say, you know, um, art is a basic need. We all understand that. Um, and I love what you mentioned, Betsy, about artists were making art even though they weren't getting, you know, even if there wasn't a, an exhibition space available or, you know, payment wasn't coming, um, that was still being done. But to Scott's point, um, you know, what does it mean for people, um, and that includes artists um, who are struggling to get those, you know, physiological and safety needs met on a daily basis, um, to be thinking about um, art and making of art, and how do we ensure um, that justice and true equity um, is, is present in the ways in which um, people are getting access to being able to enjoy and participate in the arts, make it, create it, collect it, all of these things. Um, and so I know all of you have answers to that because um, I spoke to you earlier. Um, and you know, maybe if you can talk a little bit about the ways in which in each of your various roles in the arts, um, you've sort of stepped into helping to facilitate this access for individuals, um, communities, institutions, and artists. Well, I could jump in just from a collector standpoint. So I would say that, you know, traditionally fine art has been a bit of a gated community mm -hmm. and, and a very narrow field of people that were buying it and selling it and kind of uh, curating access to the works and everything. And I do feel like um, over the last five to 10 years, there's been a real democratization through the internet and specifically really through Instagram of artists really being able to champion their own work and connect to uh, gallerists and museums and collectors themselves. Um, and I think we've bought many things just through Instagram and meeting people online. And I think that that's been something that's been really exciting to see that not you know, not just this certain subset that have been selected to be, a, you know, sold through this certain, you know, channel. Um, and I think that's fantastic to see. And there's all these new uh, projects that are happening on online that are allowing um, lots of people to collect at every different level, you know, so whether it's works on paper, whether it's big paintings, whatever, you know, and I think it's been exciting to see that kind of democratization happen. Um, and I think the other thing that we've tried to celebrate through our presence online is, is the, the, that you don't have to live in New York. You don't have to live in LA. You can be in Minot, North Dakota and, and celebrate this and be a part of this. And, and I think, um, you know, don't, don't let that deter you from getting excited and participating. So I think from the collector standpoint, that's been an exciting thing to see happen and evolve. And I think that really accelerated during the pandemic as well, because there was an incentive um, and it's been, it's, it's, it's really great. Yeah, lots of artists who like, you know, that maybe their primary medium was sculpture or painting and then they're, you know, trapped at home. And so they're creating small works on paper, which are not only, you know, something they can produce not in the studio, but also has a broader audience of people that don't usually collect art can start affording these works. And I think once you just start collecting, you buy those first things and then you want to put more time and energy into refining that collection or like seeing how important that is to your day-to-day -day life and- Well, and living with it yeah, and celebrating exactly. it. I mean, I think of the pandemic, we were here but we were surrounded by friends and, mm. and beauty and, and challenging works and, and all these things. And it was a privileged position to be in for sure. But I would say that, 
you know, you don't have to have a big painting. You can have works on paper. You can have all these other things and live with that. And I think it's a really special thing to experience. And I would tell anyone, reach out, talk to your artist friends, go to the museums. This is a lot more accessible than you think. And the pandemic has accelerated that dramatically, which has been great. I'll maybe follow that. I, I think there was a lot of trends that were happening in the field anyway that the pandemic accelerated, things that were going to happen. I think, you know, leaning towards the Instagram and maybe cutting out a gallery or a middle person for distribution of work is one of those things. But I also think, and I'm glad you mentioned this, is kind of decentralizing the art world. There is not, it is not just centralized in New York. Um, it's not. And that isn't just because most of us aren't there that I'm saying that. I think it truly is. <laughs> It is, and it doesn't mean New York isn't important, but I think it's far more distributed now in a really good way where there isn't just that kind of central focus. We're realizing we can communicate and we can be able to have this kind of broader world. But on the opposite sense, I think what happened in for a lot of institutions, it's looking closer to home. You know, Philbrook in particular, looking at local artists, looking at regional artists, that was partly because we were forced to for a period of time. That's also, I'm a big advocate for having local artists showing at museums, but. Uh, I think that a lot of institutions did shift that way somewhat out of necessity, but were looking at what was being made in their backyards and being relevant to their community. And we did a large exhibition uh, last summer that was around the Tulsa Race Massacre in alignment and all the artists that were in that show um, opted to make new work for it post George Floyd decided they want needed to make all new work responding to this moment, not just the race massacre 100 years ago, but really talking about things that had not changed. And, and really dealing with things now. But the thing that was important is we were able to acquire half of the pieces out of that collection, out of that show for our collection. So a way that we could facilitate new work for a show, but then also have it join our collection and now is kind of integrated into the, what we have up all the time. Um, but that's a part of that is we were looking with more local and regional artists mixed into that show with some national artists in a way that in a different focus than I think we maybe would have had uh, five years ago. So I think that's a real positive and something that's going to continue going forward. You know, something I found interesting that uh, you, you both touched on a bit is that um, out here, away from the major population centers, the pandemic all of a sudden created opportunity for us to get more notice. Um, I mean, I look at, at performing arts, of course, we were slammed. I mean, we were shut down for a year and a half and uh, from live performance. And frankly, a lot of the large institutions closed their doors and did nothing. Um, and all of a sudden, out here in the regions, we started doing things that were getting national notice. Um, and I think that that uh, the pandemic, in some ways, has created a way for us to maybe have a little more respect and um, uh, than we would have had otherwise had we were if if we just continued doing our our own thing here in Fargo. Um, or Tulsa or wherever. Um, so the pandemic, I think, created some opportunities that were not immediately apparent, but have become more apparent as we've gone through the last couple of years. Let's see, did you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, well, a couple of things. I'm in a co-working space right now, but so it got kind of loud for a minute, but... Um, a couple of, of thoughts related to what you were saying, Scott. Um, the, the exhibition we have up now is, is called Legacies of the Great Migration. Um, and we gave research fellowships to 12 very prominent African-American contemporary artists to research their ties to the American South through their families' migration stories. And so, you know, whether it's, Carrie Mae Weems' grandfather who disappeared from the Arkansas Mississippi Delta um, as a result of mob violence um, or the Astor Gates remembering um, with great devotion his summers spent in North Mississippi even though he was growing up in Chicago as a result of the Great Migration. Um, we've been focused on making these connections between kind of the heart of the country and the art scene in other places. And um, it just was a very deeply meaningful experience to these artists. They've 
kind of reclaimed um, their relationships with family in a lot of ways, um, with land and the importance of um, owner, black ownership of land and all of, and recognizing the inequities that that trajectory took, but also being more determined than ever to, to do something about that. And so um, that's been really heartening to see that, yes, there are these artists, but they all come from somewhere, right? And they all have stories. They have family stories that connect them. And um, the pandemic actually did, and the money we gave them as a fellowship to gave them the time and space to contemplate those things, to really look in archival collections, to visit with family members and go through treasure troves of photographs and material objects. Um, so that was that was something that was was really important. And one of the ways we've been building community around this exhibition is is actually doing block walking through um, the neighborhoods that are the most um, urban, uh, I suppose, in Jackson, and just making friends with with our neighbors and delivering art making kits and tickets and um, having conversations and learning from them through front porch conversations, their own migration stories and what they hoped the exhibition would show. So, you know, the one-on-one contact has been richer, even though, you know, as you said, David, the, the opportunities to have big crowds um, shut down. Thank you so much, Patsy and everyone. Um, you all mentioned in so many different ways, the community and connection um, and the ways in which, you know, this sort of the, the new normal around the pandemic facilitated some of that, even though we were all, you know, in our very hyper-local spaces. Um, I wanted to ask you, Rob and Eric, um, if you could share a little bit about just your own personal experiences around um, community and the arts um, and how you've sort of managed to, um, as collectors, um, foster that community. Um, if you talk to, you mentioned some of it, but I'd love to hear a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that, um, you know, just a little quick background about me. I grew up in a very conservative household in Alabama. Um, and I was, uh, and so I was kind of taught that the, the NEA was evil and should be defunded. And that's kind of my background. And, um, and, and my parents kind of weren't, weren't open, you know, we would go to museums, but contemporary art, well, not the role of the state to pay for art is definitely a big part of that. Yeah. And so we, you know, that's kind of how I grew up. And then um, we, as a couple, uh, you know, went to the David Hockney show at the DeYoung Museum and we saw this queer art, figurative art, colorful art. And it really, I think, broadened our mind as to what art could be um, and how personal it could be for us and, 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 and meaningful. And I think that really hit home also when we went to the David Wanyarovic show at the Whitney and we were walking through and seeing these, um, you know, amazing paintings and sculpture that were responding to David and his community being decimated by the HIV uh, AIDS epidemic. And, and I think that um, there were actually posters that were protesting David's art uh, about um, saying, you know, that to defund the NEA because of this, you know, homosexual pornography, this kind of thing. And I realized that that was what I was being taught when I was so young. And I saw this museum saying, no, this is important. This is special. And there was a gallery called PPOW that represents David's estate. And we saw that and we went over and met the gallerists, Wendy Ossoff and Penny Pilkington, who are fantastic um, uh, gallerists that are celebrating these communities. And I think it really uh, connecting with them and, and talking with them about what their history uh, of the gallery and then also the history of David's work and queer artists. And I think uh, that kind of opened the door to connecting with other artists around the country and other museums and galleries and, and being able to share um, those works like Kyle Dunn, um, who is another queer artist with PPOW, we were able to do a studio visit with him and meet with him and just have these conversations. We connected with another queer artist, Salman Tour, who just had a, a solo show at the Whitney Museum. And I, I will always remember being in his studio and just having these conversations about growing up 
queer, um, you know, in a in closeted and queer in this very un unwelcoming community of, of Alabama and Salman was in Pakistan, you know, and our experiences are very different, but somehow we connected on the level of, uh, of that experience, yeah. of that one experience. And I think we saw that through Salman's art, you know, um, online through Instagram, and then we're able to meet with him and, and share, and we're just sitting in his, um, in his, gap, in his studio, surrounded by these beautiful paintings, just crying and, and sharing and connecting. And I think then taking that to the next level, we're sharing Salman's work on our Instagram and connecting through that, you know, connecting to all, people all around the world that are saying, this is amazing. This is special. This is like brown queer bodies being celebrated. And, and, and I think you know, it all just happened through art and, and, and being able to have these conversations online, in person, it's really helped us, you know, learn more about ourselves, learn more about our community and learn more about our fellow hum right. human. So, and I think in uh, philosophy, there's like, a, especially like in critical theory, left-wing philosophy, there's this idea that art has this uh, intrinsic saving power, but, and it's gonna like help society somehow, but it's always a little vague on how that's gonna unfold. But with this, you know, Rob talking about these conversations, I mean, when you have people coming together and discussing things, it generates new ideas. So it's like a Plato's dialectic or Socrates dialectic. And so these art does that too. You know, it's not just the conversation of people, but between people and things. And so when art kind of takes on a life of its own, you know, it changes how we see the world. And then that changes the conversation that we're having with other people. And before long, like art works its way, it kind of worms its way into your consciousness and affects, you know, how you treat other people. And you can experience maybe um, a narrative that you were closed off to in a new way because you saw it like maybe in a pictorial form yes. rather than as an argument that you have already like strongly rejected. It happens in our home. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say community bringing it local here in Minot, you know, we have people that visit and that see these paintings and, and these sculptures and these works and it creates this dialogue and conversation here locally in our community. And I think we're able to share that um, uh, in that way. And for and, sure, and people are very surprised when they walk into our house and see the art here. I mean, it's a very conservative town and you have like the plumber, the electrician, whoever comes by and like, oh my gosh, this is, but there are amazing conversations yeah. that we have. And I think just creating um, all these dialogues and these uh, you know, local communities, national communities, international communities, it's all happened because you know, we saw a David Hockney show. It's just <laughs> fantastic and wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Robin, Eric. And uh, David or Scott or Betsy, is um, there anything you'd like to just in response to that? Um, or also just share any other sort of moments of connection or community um, personally that you've had? And I know you, Scott, Scott and Betsy, have already shared a couple of examples, but sort of to Eric's point about um, sort of the art saves and you're able to have these conversations and sort of this third, third space to be able to connect. Um, anyone wants to respond to that? I think it's, I think that uh, just really expanding or piggybacking on that, the arts gives us a shared experience of uh, whether you're in a theater, whether you're at an exhibition, something to talk to people about who you might not otherwise have anything in common with, uh, who might be on the total opposite end of the political spectrum from you. But it gives you something to talk about besides this sort of polarizing society that we live in. Uh, and I think that's a really important part of what the art the arts and art can bring to our society is this way to come together, even if we are not together in other realms. Um, and one thing that I really appreciated about your, uh, both Scott, Betsy and, and uh, Robin and Eric is that we are trying our best uh, to bring more diversity, um, whether it's racial, whether it's sexual orientation, um, whether it, and frankly, in, in terms of opera, whether it's just male and female, diversity to our, to our, our stages and to our uh, exhibitions to give voice to marginalized voices that have not been heard or have rarely been heard from. Um, and while we don't live in major population centers where we have access to much more diversity, we're doing the best we can in our places where we are uh, currently 
to show our ours uh, not only our our major citizens, but so that everyone can see themselves reflected in the art that we produce. Yeah, I would. I would even go a little further than that in terms of what we have seen as the art space and the process of engaging with art in terms of um, really making progress for racial justice. Uh, we are in, we live in a state that was has been a, a setting of famous racial violence, um, especially during the civil rights movement and before um, that, the foundational nature of our state is, is that of the country that was, you know, built, uh, wealth was built here for other places, for New England and, and England um, and other countries based on stolen land and stolen labor. And, you know, we've got 14 at least generations of racial trauma um, that that many people in our state live with, and when the, uh, the George Floyd murder happened in 2020, we realized that some of the skills that we have been using in the galleries uh, with visitors, in terms of small groups uh, looking closely at works of art that respond to ideas about race or realities about race. Um, could actually be helpful in a bigger context. And so we developed um, a project called Art and Storytelling that we have taken to the corporate sector. And some local corporations are now using this as their DEIA training. So instead of going to workshops where you define terms like microaggressions and implicit bias, people in small groups with their colleagues at work are looking at artworks um, where they're asked to relate um, what's going on in a, in a painting or a sculpture to their experience, their lives. And um, it's, it's been very profound actually to have these people respond and say, I never knew my colleague had been through that kind of history. I never knew you know, that he was carrying this with him to work every day. Uh, I've, I've, I've learned to respect the lives of my colleagues in ways I never knew uh, was possible before. And it really is just by sharing an experience of looking at art together. In some ways it's less threatening than, you know, a workshop where you're role playing and things like that, um, but much more healing and much more profound. So I, I think we often underestimate the assets that we have in the arts community to make profound change. And I think, you know, the more we take advantage of what, what we are all trained to do um, in terms of programming and share it with the larger community, um, the more progress we'll make. That's great, Bev. Sam, I'll just jump in kind of following that. Uh, so at Philbrook, when I came in, we, we redid our mission statement, our strategic plan, and kind of all of it. And the biggest task for your strategic plan, your mission statement, is going through a pandemic, um, where you kind of get really see, is this truly what we're about? And for us, the mission statement, we simplified it down. The task I gave to the, to the staff and the board is we need a mission statement that can fit on a t-shirt and that you can remember and actually means something. So it's to make a creative community through art and gardens. That's what we do. And of course our strategic plan supports that, but I think was really uh, affirming is going through the last two years and having that hold true. And that it wasn't just in words, but we were able to do that in action. So partly with the community as we realized very early on is that people needed some of the things that we could provide them. One of them was just a backyard. So we have 25 acres of gardens. So we opened them up so that people could come and just use the outdoor space when people couldn't go anywhere else and could safely come and do so. And we did simple things like put up swings and we turned the sprinklers on on Saturdays and let kids come run through the sprinklers. And we brought in like food trucks and did things like that, that we could do safely. But again, just realizing there was a need in the community to do things like that. 
And then we shifted to thinking about who are the artists or the businesses that were lacking a space. So we opened it up to yoga studios and places that could come and use the outdoor space to be able to um, host and basically make money. And then we started hosting musicians and artists and others that didn't have those venues that they could use indoors. Um, so I think that was important to be able to adapt in that way. We also took our, we had a vegetable garden that was producing for our uh, restaurant, but also produces for the food bank. And instead of dialing that down, we actually tripled the size. So now we have a 35,000 square foot vegetable garden that produces um, almost a ton and a half of food for the food bank um, out of our garden. But it also provided a way that staff could go out there and volunteer and it became a respite for them as well. So it's something that kind of offered this place that we could go that kind of supported mental health, but also was giving back to the community. And I think that was something where we felt as an institution, we were actively giving in places where people needed that right now. And then as we could shift more into some of our, you know, more traditional art activities, how can we find that other need? So, you know, Tulsa has a similar, very fraught history with race here. And we were dealing with the Race Massacre Centennial commemoration last year. And we had a lot of programs around that. Then of course, you know, George Floyd happened uh, as well. And there's many other things doing native communities here in Oklahoma. So there's a lot of different layers. And how could we do that in a really honest, uh, in transparent way. So uh, there's many different things we've done, but the one I'll share with you is that we took down our kind of historic interpretive space that would talk about the historic home and the, you know, the rich white people that lived here and then gave it to the <laughs> museum. Um, and we turned instead that space over to something where we talk about the native people that were here, kind of how that property became into the possession of those that came before us. And then when the building was built, and then when it became a museum and all those kind of different generations all the way up to present day and we have it up with photos the big difference is there is that the public can go into post it notes and ask any question they want and then we go in daily and answer the questions to our best of our ability and some of those questions are really you know simple like where do the cats sleep that live in our garden those are easy um but they're also did the Phillips family that had the mansion here participate in the race master. And we answer those honestly and transparently and have those conversations that are up there. And in that case, you know, as far as we know, they did not, but we could only go to the limit of the knowledge, the information that we have. Uh, but I think it's created a way that we can kind of really try to live that and have that transparent conversation happening with the public. And it's created a lot more entry points for people that we hope will kind of uh, um, continue on. Thank you so much, Scott and everyone. Um, we do have about 35 minutes here and I'm um, wondering if we can maybe pause a little bit and see if there's any questions as you've heard from the panelists um, for the last half hour, 45 minutes or so. Um, if anyone has any questions from the audience here for our panelists or any thoughts as you're listening. Well, I have a question for anyone in the audience. Um, you know, is art a basic need? Well, as you think about that, you feel free to put that in the chat if you'd like. Um, and I'll, I'll see if I can monitor that. And maybe Sandy, you can help me out if anyone chimes in there. Um, or Kyla, someone can, <laughs> can, uh, can chime in there. Um, well, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground here. I think. Um, I, I did want to maybe David and Scott um, ask a question specifically as you sort of put your artist hats on um, around um, arts and I guess, is art a basic need for you as an artist? And then thinking about, um, we introduced that idea with Sandy about the hierarchy of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, how has arts, the arts and being an artist helped sort of your own self-actualization as artists? You want to start, David, or you want me to go? Go ahead, Scott. <laughs> um, you know, it's, again, like I said before, I think artists are going to make art. And it, but I think you may find different outlets for that at different periods of time. Like, you know, I still make work, but I'm not making work to necessarily show as much anymore. It's just I don't have the time to do that as much as I wish I, I did. But again, I think it becomes a place that you go to kind of, you need that outlet whether it's at work or something that you do after. Um, and you find different paths for that. You know, for me, it might be 
DJing a night. It might be doing, um, you know, painting and doing kind of my practice there. It might be, I play in the weekends with a bunch of artists on a baseball team. So it can come in a lot of different ways that you find that outlet. But I think what it is, is that you're doing something that feels creative and you're part of that process. And sometimes it's just being able to think and be able to think in that way, because I do think there's a different process that's there. I think the interesting thing that's happened, and this is something that I'm sure maybe others have struggled with this, is that when we enter a crisis, there's that early phase of it where it's actually kind of energizing because you're dealing with everything so fast and making you know, decisions by the minute and dealing with that kind of immediacy. The pandemic was different in a way because it just kept going. So we had this durational crisis that did have different phases to it and did have different ways that we responded. And I think in that there was a different type of exhaustion that happens. And I think that was also one of the first things to go when you're stressed like that is creativity, because it's not necessarily that's something that's, you know, I'm talking even from a work perspective, because it's something where you're really trying to get through the day and deal with whatever fires popped up today and what mask mandates changed that you need to rewrite everything. And like all of that, the kind of the luxury at times it feels to be creative is the thing that gets set aside. And I think that's unfortunate. And I think it's the thing that needs to come back in. Because I know for myself, like looking, like what I need to like recharge is not having a week off and do nothing. That'd be great too. But like, but it's also one of those things that I need to basically have the opportunity to be creative and have that different charge. So it's actively doing something where I feel like I'm in control and can have that spark that's to it. So I think everybody needs to find their own path with that. Artists obviously do that. And for me, that's changed a lot over the last two years. And sometimes it, it was just sitting at our kitchen table with our two boys and just making drawings together and passing them back and forth and having that activity and that did that. Um, so anyway, I'm interested to hear what, what David may have to say too. Well, it's interesting that uh, you know you, you talk about what, what happened to you during the pandemic and, and how much it was, how much maybe more art became important I was fortunate that I grew up in a family that valued art, um, having grown up about a half a mile from the Philbrook Art Center in Tulsa. Uh, we were over there all the time, playing in the gardens, and you know, and as or as much as we were allowed to back in those days. Uh, my mother was a docent at that other art museum in Tulsa, um, and um, but my parents had subscriptions to the Philharmonic and the opera and all that kind of thing. Um, and, but I didn't go to school intending to be a uh, singer. Um, I actually was pre-med when I started university. And, um, but somewhere along the way, it, it, I discovered that I am really driven by the need to create beauty in the world. And whether that is through my own art uh, as a singer, whether it's, I'm also a stained glass artist, um, or whether it is by producing art for others to enjoy. Um, I think that that the uh, wanting wanting to create beauty for for everyone around me and to leave some kind of legacy of of, of creation of beauty uh, really is a, a driving force for me and and I don't know where it came from but I I think it had to do a lot with growing up in a family that valued art and maybe to now give that a, uh, to maybe someone who's not growing up in that family and family who, that values are particularly, but at least giving them the experience in their, in their school or in their, uh, in their childhood, the opportunity to experience that art. Thank you, David and Scott. And I think you both said it really well too. And I mean, to, to create is human. Um, and so everyone sort of has access to that, 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 that creative verb, that drive, that ability to do that. Um, and so Betsy or Robin, Eric, do you have anything to sort of add in terms of um, your, your own personal experience with the arts and self-actualization? Well, I think, um, you know, just going back to the theme of beauty, you know, um, I'm, this philosopher Elaine Scar Scarry has written a treatise on beauty and how, you know, by seeing beautiful things, and she gives an example of a vase that, you know, um, she like grows up with, and it's this fragile, delicate object that there, she has in her house um, as a child. And from that, she kind of extrapolates that like, you know, there are other beautiful things just by seeing more, you know, average vases or whatever in her day-to-day -day activity. And um, it's just very interesting how art kind of helps us to recognize um, other things around us that might like go unnoticed and are just 
uh, mundane existence. And so it's not just, you know, a vase, but I think, you know, great examples of public art can do that. It can help you see the world in a new way. Architecture, gardens, you know, arts are, you know, so broad. You know, when we talk about art, I think a lot of people, you know, initially just think of paintings on walls, but it's everywhere. And, you know, when our society is denied that, it uh, closes off so many avenues towards not only self-expression for the artist, but, you know, the realization of the other through encountering the work of art. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think of poetry on the subway. You know, yeah. there's this uh, in New York City, they have these poems with uh, coupled with an artist and you're just sitting there writing and seeing that. And it just changes your whole experience of the journey, you know, in the subway. Um, and it's really special how that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, and just those little moments that are accessible to everyone through that public space, I think is fantastic. You know, when we uh, closed down and we weren't doing programs, the one the two programs that we were kind of, that that our people insisted that we continue well, were the art therapy programs and we did them virtually, but the, the people um, with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's or dementia um, needed, they needed to keep having that experience looking at art and making art as did the people living with cancer um, who are part of our um, creative healing studio. So, I mean, I think that says a lot about, you know, the just people, the most vulnerable people in a lot of ways um, had the most need for um, continuing to make and, and to continuing to, to use that part of their brains in some way. Totally. And I would jump in as far as the healing power of art goes. There's a program called RX Art, which brings uh, art to hospitals and, and works with contemporary artists. Uh, and then Nicholas Party did this massive mural uh, in, a, in, a ho in a hospital and Jonas Wood is some curtains. And I, and I think it's just been really special to see, you know, these spaces can feel very imposing, very scary working with children that are going to surgery. It's scary, it's upsetting. And I think uh, creating spaces that are more welcoming, that are, are fun and pretty and exciting through art uh, is really amazing to see how, 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 how much of a healing aspect that can have just to be around those images and those colors and everything. And it's not gonna fix everything, but at the same time, it can be a, a wonderful part of making that a better experience for people. Um, and I think it's really lovely. Yeah, to see threatening. yeah for sure. Nicole, there, there was a comment that was talking about, it talked about Plains Art Museum, but I think all of us who were involved in, in art spaces can relate to it that, that museums created after we were closed places that were healthy and safe and they also revealed the largeness of the arts community uh, that it wasn't just you know yes it was local but there, there's a community that's huge that it's worldwide and that we are all connected Definitely. Thank you for that that um, that comment. I think I'm scrolling up here, Lauren. Um, and yeah, I think it goes back to exactly what we've been talking about um, in terms of, of community and, and um, the connections that were being made. And I, I do love that point about um, that it being a safe place. I mean, it was in during the pandemic, you know, some of these spaces were actually in real life, like safe that you could go and and, and there were all these safety measures, but also that sort of psychological safety, um, you know, that was also so important and ha continues to be because we're not out of the woods yet. Um, so important um, during this time. Um, I see some other comments here and I'll, um, I'll one, read this. One, go one ahead, thing, Tim. Nicole, I, I wonder, um, what was it like in Rochester with Mayo Clinic, which is, you know, the, the apex for many of, of health and healing? What was it like there? Yeah, well, um, we locked down pretty quickly um, and we've remained locked down in a lot of ways. Um, over 60% of the workforce um, went home um, and uh, areas were closed off. For any of you that have been down here to Rochester, um, our downtown sort of the heart of our city is really the Mayo Clinic, right? And so um, it, to have the Mayo Clinic um, and the 
uh, such a large part of the workforce sort of shut down um, also meant that a lot of the activation that would happen in our downtown area um, and the, the heart again of the city um, really was not happening. Um, so there was that sort of that kind of, um, I think we all face in our different local locations, um, but it was very stark because we, we do live in a very small city. Um, and so not having that, um, you know, everything shut down. I also, um, at the same time, um, I, just like you all were saying, there was a lot more um, connection. So part of my role at um, the, the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science um, is to do um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and anti-racism work with our students. Um, you know, the summer of 2020 um, happened. We had the uh, murder of George Floyd right in our state um, and right in our sister city. And so I think um, there was a lot of trauma, not just of the healthcare workers, um, but then also the trauma, um, the racial trauma of people sort of being in, in this pandemic situation, also reeling from um, the, the unrest and things that were happening in that nature. And so some of the work that I was doing was um, kind of putting together what Betsy has been talking a lot of sort of um, thinking about the limits of DEI and anti-racism work and how we can incorporate um, more of the arts in that space. And so I worked with the humanities and medicine at the time and they had a whole program already established around um, arts and healing and narrative medicine. And we started to offer that um, as spaces to have these really tough conversations. Um, as an institution, um, the institution, again, if for those of you who've ever been to Rochester, we have this big building called the Plumber Building. Um, and it's a, a work of art in its own right, has these um, massive doors um, uh, that uh, never close, only on very sort of somber occasions every, you know, 50 years. Um, they close the doors um, shortly after the murder of George Floyd um, to sort of symbolize um, that the Mayo Clinic um, and the community, the city of Rochester, um, was committed to eliminating racism um, and the ways in which they were going to do that. And it was a really interesting time because they opened, they closed the doors and they opened it up again. Um, and um, it was was one of the few times that people came back to kind of see that event. Um, but I thought it was a really interesting moment as well because the Plumber Building um, is, is such a sort of architectural and sort of artistic kind of landmark in our city. Um, and so it was, it almost felt like an arts moment in that in, at the same time. Um, and I'm just rambling, but there were just a lot of things that happened. It's hard to kind of summarize the last three years um, in, in that way, but Rochester definitely felt it um, at, in terms of the city. I think a lot of conversations that we weren't able to happen before um, ended up happening um, or conversations that had been deferred or delayed um, ended up happening because of sort of this confluence of not only the pandemic um, and the fact that so many of our um, our, so much of our workforce is in healthcare in some way, shape, or form, um, and then also um, that that racial justice aspect of it that was really um, so urgent as well um, came together. And I think our arts community um, also uh, really, I mean, that the arts community in Rochester in a lot of ways has been really decentralized, and there was a way in which um, the arts community also came together, diversified in a lot of ways, started to think about their work a little bit differently and a little bit more urgently, and were given the space to do so. So I think I, I just echo what everyone has been sharing about what's been happening in their own communities and their own art spaces, because I certainly feel like that that happened here in Rochester as well. And um, I think it happened across the country um, in a lot of different ways. Nicole, I um, don't know if you noticed uh, the um, comment in the uh, chat about um, how Alzheimer's and dementia patients are often able to access um, and participate in music, uh, even when all most of their other mental facilities have, have been truncated. Um, and I think it really, again, speaks to what, you know, is, is some of the basis of our humanity and the ability to to enjoy music, enjoy the arts, even though you you may have some other mental difficulties, um, it, it really does speak to our to the how basic art is to us. Oh, thank you for that, David. Thank you for the comment in the chat here. Um, Nicole, if if I'm not mistaken, you have created a toolkit. Oh, yes. Yes, Sandy, I did um, in 2016, the Rochester Racial Justice Toolkit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is it available to the general public? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's, it's, a, it's just a website. I, I created it after um, the, the death of Philando Castile, um, and it was just a 
uh, opportunity for the community here in Rochester to kind of talk about racial justice and have some tools at their disposal. There wasn't really anything um, at the time. Now there's a lot. <laughs> there wasn't a lot at the time, um, you know, that community members could engage with um, that wasn't sort of outside of like a university setting. And so I just kind of uh, took some of my resources and pulled things from across the internet um, to create um, just some tools for kind of individual self-led kind of learning. Um, and in 2020, it did get um, a lot more um, uh, popularized um, because of the conversations we we're having nationwide. And uh, the Washington Post and the Lily um, did a, a feature about um, some of the content in there, but it is available. I haven't updated it in quite a while. Um, uh, because after it got so popular, it needed sort of like a whole, <laughs> a whole um, mechanism to kind of keep it going. But I'd be happy to share the link, um, at Sandy, if you'd like to share. Yeah, we will do that. Sure. Are there any other? Um, I guess I'm the the chat here. Um, if there are any other thoughts in addition to the chat in the audience as you're again listening, continuing to listen here, any questions you have for the panelists or myself? Clearly, Sandy has implicated me in some questions. I have a question. Go ahead, Janet. I wanted to hear a little bit about art as a basic need beyond the pandemic. I know um, I agree with you that it really brought the the impact to light but what would our panelists say about just as an ongoing need for humanity um through the arts thank you excellent question janet panelists well i think one thing we as i mentioned before the, the fact that it gives us something to talk about besides everything that polarizes us is really important um one thing that we had touched on in our discussion on Tuesday as panelists um, was that um, I've often been jealous of my colleagues in Canada and in Europe because of the great societal governmental support for the arts. And we've seen a taste of that uh, during the pandemic. Um, and uh, unfortunately, of course, now we're going to see that all go away. Uh, but does it have to? I mean, can we, can we not find a, a nice, medium ground here where we where we aren't aren't always feeling as our institutions like we're continually struggling for even the basic resources that we need to continue operation and create art um and yet um and yet balance that with the needs of society as a whole yeah david i think that that's um you know a great point and there's uh, such a, a movement here in the US to defund the arts and say that it's not the state's responsibility to pay for the arts. But, you know, if it isn't, who, who's going to do it? You know, if it's uh, corporations or just wealthy people, you know, there is usually an agenda and at least the state can kind of um, separate itself out from the actual work of art by just providing grants or, you know, whatnot. But we've seen like through all this entire panel about how much the arts have meant to communities. And we, there's always a, a need, I think, in a capitalist country to quantify the value of the arts to some kind of economic metric. But we see that e even though there's so much data that shows that art actually is economically important for a culture, a society, you know, it, what it really does is build these communities and it you know, creates these spaces and these a shared language or, you know, a new interpretations of what we see in our day to day lives. And that's just so crucial. And I don't know how we can, um, you know, translate that evidence into state action, but I guess, you know, voting, but, you know, here we are on the importance of art and why it's so necessary because of all of these things that it's done for, for all of our communities around us and how important the museum is or the you know, the artist is, the gallery structure, whatever, it's, um, you know, it gets those voices out there, it amplifies these messages, it allows us to, you know, hear and see other people's point of view. And really, I think a lot of um, that is also based on the fact that, you know, we think of our identities as fixed, but they're really just a constellation of stories. And the more stories that we can tell about ourselves and about other people allows us to see these people as real, active, 
agents and not just some, you know, predetermined, prejudged other that we, you know, have like these absolute ideas about. Yeah. And a perfect example of that is, you know, Betsy bringing this amazing show mm -hmm. to Mississippi and, 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 and creating the space to have these conversations, to celebrate, to argue, to discuss, to heal, um, you know, doing that all over the country and to be a part of this group talking about this. I mean, that's the community. We're a part of this community, you know, it's, it's been so special. And I think continuing that as we go forward um, as a country is something that could help us heal and help us talk to each other. Well, I think there's a whole conversation to be had about the fact that our business model is broken um, and that it doesn't, it may have worked in the 19th century for museums, but you know, when we're dependent yeah. on gifts from wealthy benefactors, as you've said, there's an issue there about equity and access. And the fact that, you know, that in these countries that you mentioned, David, where the government sees art as essential as roads and libraries and sewers and everything else, then everyone feels that they have a right to experience it. And, and we are seeing the consequences of not having lived that way because some people do feel excluded from museums. Some people have been excluded from museums. And the only way that's going to change is to have a different business model where um, either we figure out a new way of active participation um, that monetizes itself, or we, we do have that kind of broad government support. Well, yeah, uh, as, as, ahead, as the fundraiser among us, uh, there is one state that's got it right, and that's Minnesota. Uh, the Minnesota State Arts Board is phenomenal. The state of Minnesota has made funding the arts a, a constitutional amendment. Uh, it's required that a certain percentage of monies go uh, to the arts. Um, and I will tell you what a difference a river makes just being, um, <laughs> you know, 50 feet from Minnesota and not being able to take part in, in that a remarkable uh, agreement between the, the, the state government and the people of, of Minnesota. Uh, I, would, I would suggest every state look to uh, the Minnesota State Arts Board as, the, as a, a, a possible uh, mender of the broken business model. Yeah, Sandy, I mean, I, I remember being part of lobbying for that act to get that through way back in the day, <laughs> but it was, uh, but it's also, you know, as important as that is, it's, it's a small percentage of the overall operating budget that comes out of that. And to kind of, you know, I think there's a whole nother panel for probably another day that we can talk about the broken business model uh, <laughs> in nonprofits. I can tell you right now, I am looking at our budget and I need to shave a million dollars off by the end of the day. Uh, and that's just the 25% of labor and supply costs that have gone up over last year. That's basically to tread water to cut that much. And I know that's happening across probably every business in the country right now is dealing with that kind of thing that we're, you know, we're trying to equitably support our staff and all of the things that we're doing here at the museum, but the costs are much, much higher. So in order to do that, it's to come up with different ways. And, you know, as Betsy mentioned, like it, so much of the nonprofit feel is built on the generosity of a few wealthy donors, and that is changing. It's changing rapidly, and corporate giving is changing. So we're having to look far more entrepreneurially about this, and in different states are different. So in Oklahoma, we get zero dollars from the state and from the city, and I've got a giant tent going on in the front lawn because I need to raise $4 million next week for our mm -hmm. gala, um, and that is a huge percentage of our operating budget. Uh, that we do, but that's, you know, we're all finding our other path there. But I think coming back to the original question is that your budget is a value statement. So what's in that and how you choose to use that money and how you choose to, and how a society chooses to allocate that money says a lot about what they value. We talk all the time about the arts being important, just like we are today. And then economically, it just isn't there. And I think I was mentioned in the chat here is about education. That's a really good example 
What's the first thing that gets cut? The art and the music programs. Um, you know, the football team is the last thing that gets cut typically. So it's like, what, where do you value things there? And I think speaking from the museum's perspective, we can see the change in education just based on who's coming into the galleries and the lack of knowledge because they're getting so little education in schools and even in colleges that we're starting at a whole different entry point of coming into a museum where we're having to kind of meet people where they are. That isn't necessarily a bad thing. That's partly our job, but that entry point is very different than it would have been 25 years ago. And that's also in that same thing is it's hard for an audience to understand the value of what it is that they have no idea even what, what you do. So anyway, that's a whole, that's probably a whole nother panel. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Uh, Sandy, we gave, uh, I, I heard about three different topics there um, for future conversations, for sure. Um, are there actually, any other? I, I actually was just talking with a couple of my staff members. I said, okay, we're gonna go live next time with Art and Business Breakfast. I need a topic. Well, I, I think I got one. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, are there any other thoughts from the, from the audience or any closing thoughts from the panelists here in the last 10 minutes? Well, I would certainly say y'all come back. Um, we've we've seen, uh, and I don't know how, how it is in the museum world, but in the performing world, we've seen audiences shrink by 50, 60% and talk about the business model. I mean, how do we sustain if we have no, if, if we have that much drop in revenue from, from ticket sales? Um, and so it's I, one thing that I'm always encouraging people to do is get off the couch and get back out and get back in the habit of going to, um, to experience art live um, and uh, get out and, and um, support your local arts organizations because if you don't, we're not gonna be here. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about this idea of community and I think supporting your local community, celebrating your local community, connecting with, uh, you know, we're on the board of our of the Tall Bay Art Museum here in Minot and then connecting with Andy and Sandy at the Plains, you know, and supporting that. And I think what we, what we've tried to do as well as encourage other people to do that where you're at, you know, one of our friends is in North Carolina with the Mint Museum, you know, uh, these, lo these, these uh, local museums that can celebrate that. And I think uh, encouraging and celebrating that together is a way to help um, grow as a community, um, you know, it, um, yeah, and then just having these institutions come up with these new ways to engage. I mean, well, we need to bring people back to the arts, but the arts, I think, have to figure out ways to show their importance to the general community that they're in. And, you know, having opening up the gardens at the, you know, your institution, it was like such a great idea to you know, get people to come and see what's out there. And, you know, we talked about this at the very beginning, like the, the idea that the arts are somehow this rarefied mm -hmm. space that it's only open to a select few. And it's, it's so untrue. We've just cultivated, not we personally, but just like our society has cultivated that view that it's like an elitist activity to be involved in the arts. When really, I mean, it's like the furthest thing from the truth. Even art collecting, you know, mm -hmm. buy your friend's drawing, yeah. you know, like it's not elitist. It's something we can all celebrate together. And I think that's something that we're trying to do um, as a community yeah. and, and, and as a couple. And, and this has been a great way to think about new ideas, to, uh, ways to do that. I think the last thing I'll share is I think part of it is there's been a spirit of collaboration that's come out of the last couple of years that needs to continue. And I think that's partly as all of our organizations and whomever it is, is figuring different things out or trying things is sharing that information freely and not keeping it to themselves so that we can figure things out together about what our path is forward and help everybody. I think the more that we have that kind of spirit and that generosity, it's gonna help, no matter what the field is, will help across society. Sandy, do you have any other closing thoughts here? This has been fabulous. And I'm, I can't wait to get it out, get it recorded and get it out. Thank you all uh, for your time today. Uh, 
it has been enlightening. I think we could have gone on. And as, as I said at the beginning, we'll see where the conversation takes us. And it took us in a couple of different directions. And um, I thank you for my topic for next, next uh, Art and Business Breakfast. We'll make sure that you're invited to uh, at least be uh, listeners on that. Uh, Betsy, wish, wish I were in Tupelo so I could just come up and see your exhibition. Um, it is, uh, it's uh, stunning, uh, uh, the concept and the artists that you have in it. Uh, Rob and Eric, good luck. Hope things start to melt soon <laughs> up there. Um, I'm just glad you're, again, on, I'm glad you're on a hill, so it's not going to collect. Um, David, I haven't been to the opera in several years when I was in Santa Fe, and I look forward to uh, testing my ears. Uh, uh, Scott, you get back here, uh, come on by. Um, uh, I'm hoping to be in Houston, so maybe uh, in the middle of, <laughs> middle of summer. Uh, but you know, I, I, there is a flight from Houston to Tulsa. We'll, we'll get it done. Nicole, wowza, thank you. <laughs> thank you all panelists. Thanks from, so much for joining us audience. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll see some of you next time for the, we, they, we'll see you next time for the next Art and Business Breakfast. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks thank everyone. You. Bye guys. Bye.